one. Hello, hello. We are officially live. This is Mike Wall, and welcome back to the Agent Revolution podcast. I am super excited today to be joined by uh, my new friend, mega agent and uh, investor extraordinaire, Miss Christy Moore. We are going to uh, we're going to deconstruct um, we're going to deconstruct kind of some of the 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 things that we think more agents should do to add more money to their bottom line, and we're going to talk exclusively about. Uh, kind of doing that through investing in real estate. And so I'm really excited because I've got Christy on the show today. And, um, and I know you're going you're gonna to school some people today. So welcome <laughs> to the show, Christy. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. I was fortunate enough to get to meet you at a, at a mastermind event uh, for the Kentucky Derby down in Cincinnati uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was so funny that you were there because I had actually been thinking about this. I, I'm just, I'm really surprised. I think there's a big disconnect in our industry. There's just not enough real estate agents investing in real estate. And, and I know you and I share that, that, that same kind of passion because we see, oftentimes we'll see agents who will actually sit in front of a really good deal and they won't even recognize it. And so what I hope we can do today is kind of raise the awareness of agents um, all across America, who who maybe we can open their open their awareness to to maybe look for different things as they sit in front of sellers, and uh, I know you're going to talk about how to uh, how to uh, acquisitions for off market deals, and that's going to be really exciting too. So, without further ado, um, Christy Moore, let's get started. Okay, great. So, um, one of the things that I I'm really 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 passionate about as far as real estate and just people in general is helping people with their finances and their wealth. Um, so I think, you know, for me, investing in real estate, um, it's kind of something that I always wanted to do, but I just fell into. And um, I've learned a lot of lessons along the way that I think are very helpful for people. I mean, I've, I've you know, paid the government hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I do differently now than when I first started. But I think that, you know, we yeah. have to start off with the basics, right? As far as yep. where where do you find where do you even find the deals? Right. And I know that you're you're a big investor, so um, you know the main thing. Uh, I mean, we're all in real estate. We all do lead generation and lead conversion and things like that. And investing isn't really any different than that. You still have to find the sellers, find the properties, negotiate the deals. So we're still doing what we do on a daily basis. We're just doing it. Um, for ourselves and our for our family versus you know uh, brokering a deal. Yep. So what, do this real quick. Just kind of set the tone. Um, give a little quick bio on yourself. Um, how long you've been into real estate? Um, tell me uh, something interesting. I'm always um, finding is that you know either you you were led into real estate by either the investing side or the residential side, and then one side led to the other. How how did that go for you? <laughs> I got to be a little careful because there might be some people on here that uh, some information might get back to. But anyway, so I um, I actually started in the mortgage business and then I ended up um, buying my first house as a short sale. And my first house had gobs of problems. Um, and this was in Michigan at the time. Now I'm in D.C. So, um, you know, I brought I bought the property as a fixer upper. I knew it, knew it needed a lot of work. I didn't know about all the structural issues that came up after um, you know, spring came, but that's a whole other story. We'll talk about some other time. But anyway, so I, that's how I got started was actually investing in real estate. Um, but it was also right before the market crashed. So I started noticing that I had a bunch of contracts on properties and I started noticing that the market was changing, meaning like literally nobody was looking at houses. Nobody. I mean, 200,000 people a week were losing their jobs at GM and Ford. So, um, you know, I was uh, really nervous about what was happening and I was only 24. I didn't understand what I understand now as far as market cycles and that kind of thing. Sure. Um, but I got really nervous and I backed out of all of these contracts at the time and um, lost tens of thousands of dollars in, in EMD money. But it, I didn't, you know, looking back, it was one of the smartest things that I ever did because sure. I would have lost yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars and possibly even gone bankrupt had I actually continue down that road. So once I backed out of all of those properties, um, I, I actually got into, you know, retail, what we call retail residential real estate. So helping people buy and sell properties because 
my experience working with realtors was so unbelievably horrible. I mean, they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, I had, they didn't have any scruples. I mean, I, you know, even the agent that I worked with when I bought my house, I mean, he had done so many things unethically and I, I just, it was it just horrible. So I was like, if this is what people are getting as a consumer, I should be doing this because I can add value to, yeah. you know, people's lives. And then I got into, um, and then I started flipping houses after the market crashed. So it was a little bit different because I went from retail, I went from investing to retail back to investing. And then um, I flipped a bunch of houses during the 2009, 2010, 2011 timeframe. And mm -hmm. I was working with my, uh, my ex at the time and we just couldn't, we couldn't work together. It was, it was atrocious. So in my, in, you know, thought of like saving our relationship, I got back into residential real estate, got back into retail working with clients. So I didn't have to work with him yeah. <laughs> on all these projects that were super stressful. Um, and then, you know, after we, we ended our marriage and everything, I got back into investing. So I've been kind of back and forth. Um, and now I'm developing an actual system to kind of, you know, make the investment investing part. Uh, a little more streamlined. So that's where I'm at today. But that's 12 yeah. years in the making. So there's so much, like literally we could not talk about as much as we would need to in a normal um, 45 minute to an hour <laughs> podcast, just because there's so much here. Yeah. But, you know, I, I like if the, to the average agent who's sitting here watching this, that's thinking, man, I, yeah, I would love to start doing some investing. And I just, I don't know where to start. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I sell, I, I, maybe I sell, you know, 10, 15, 25 houses a year. Um, what, what do you recommend to that, that agent or that broker? Um, where do they get started? Well, and that's actually how I started. I mean, I wasn't selling like hundreds of houses a year. I was, I was selling at the time that I got uh, back into investing, you know, after the market crash, I was only selling like 20 houses a year. Um, but I was very budget conscious and that, that's what I was saying earlier about, you know, I'm very passionate about helping people with their finances because, you know, people spend like $500 a month on Starbucks and Uber and things that they don't even realize. So I, um, made it a goal to get back into investing. And so I started monitoring my budget, paying down my debt, you know, doing all the boring things that we have to do. Right. To, mm -hmm. you know, to gain wealth. And then once I paid off all of my student loans, I took uh, um, the money that I had saved and um, invested in my my first deal post market crash um, mm -hmm. with about twenty two thousand dollars. It was my primary residence. So I was able to get a loan for 10 percent down and it was a renovation loan. There's there's amazing um, programs out there for people, especially if it's their primary residence to be able to rehab mm -hmm. a property. And that's really where you can start, especially from a tax standpoint. Um, you know, if you make money on that property and you set, you live there for two years, you can sell it tax free and, and put it into the next place. I mean, that's, you know, the very basics of it. And I think that that's something that we as real estate agents don't really even take advantage of is the, the, all of the mm -hmm. tax laws that are out there that, um, you know, that protect your wealth as well as help you pay less in taxes, um, you know, from, sure. from that standpoint. I mean, it's it's amazing how much more your wealth grows when you grow it tax free than when you're paying, you know, 30 to 40 percent um, on your gains uh, year after year. Yeah. It, you know, th that that slide that you showed about um, about flipping properties versus holding them. Um, mm -hmm. That was just amazing because you're right. It's like when you, and I'm sitting here thinking, cause my, my business partner is down here with me in Florida and it's like, we like, they hit, I mean, you get hit hard on that flip income. I mean, because it's, you know, it, it, it it's, it's income. Now granted you, you're turning it around faster and hopefully you're, you know, you're putting it into a different project, but I'll tell you I, the, the, the place that we're in right now, what I was talking to you about before is we actually um, from a mailer that we did like, back in 2017, we bought a commercial building from that mailer and um, we held the property. We actually rented it back to the guy that was living there. We held the property uh, and then we put it on the market this year and we got an offer. We, we bought it for like 108 and then we, we, we got it under <laughs> contract. Like, it, <laughs> yeah. What it, it, and that part doesn't matter. What I'm saying is that, you know, people like, what do you, 
people, the, the, all these things hold everybody back and, and it's really not that hard. And I know that to that agent out there that's listening to us right now, they're, they have all these limiting beliefs. They're like, well, I, I don't, I can't come up with the money. I don't know what I don't know. You know what I mean? And, and so that's who I really want to connect with today because you guys are the front lines. Like you, like you sit in front of some sellers right now and some sellers are motivated and you don't even know it. You're thinking about getting a, a $5,000 commission when there's a $50,000 you know, maybe assignment fee or, 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 you know, um, a hundred thousand dollar flip sitting right in front of you or a potential rental. Right. Right. And so like, what do you, what do you, you sat in front of that room and you could kind of see, even in that room, not everybody connects with the idea of investing. And those were high level people. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Oh, I mean, it's the same reason why people don't do anything. It's, you know, it's a lot of fear and lack of desire. I mean, if you really, really, really want something, you desire it so greatly, you will do whatever it takes to get it. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't really have that kind of desire. And then on the flip side, they have a lot of fear. I mean, it's very scary. It's a lot of risk, you know, buying a property for, you know, a hundred, a hundred or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, mm -hmm. if the market shifts, you could be left holding the bag where you owe more than what it's worth. And um, where, like you said, where do you get the money? I promise if you find the deals, the money will come. You do not need to find money. It will come to you. I'll invest in your deal. You find a deal, you let me know. I'll be an investor. Exactly. That money <laughs> is not the issue. People, if, like I said, if you have a solid deal, people with money will come to you. We actually, um, when we were flipping in the down market, um, you know, we, one of our partners had $10 million, $10 million in cash in the bank. Like we didn't have $10 million in cash, but we leveraged our strengths, which was, you know, finding the deals and renovating the houses and that kind of stuff. Um, and knowing what it was worth at the end and negotiating a great price at the end, um, with his strengths, which was he had a bunch of money in the bank. So, um, yeah. you know, if, if, if you find it, they will come, but I think it's really about getting, over that initial fear, um, you know, I mean, I, it, I'm fearful all the time, but I do things anyway. I, I realize that I'm fearful and I, you know, put myself into a different state before I make decisions. I don't want to make fearful decisions. Um, yeah. But I think you that make that, educated decisions, right? And, and right. you understand the risk. Right. So if I'm going into something, I'm going in eyes wide open. And I also think that if you are fearful, the one way to kind of um, eliminate that or at least reduce it is to look at all of your options. I mean, the great thing about property is that you can resell it, you can rent it, you can move into it. There's a lot of things that you can do. So knowing that you have, um, actually, I think it was Tony Robbins, Money Master the Game, they talk about protecting your downside, right? So mm -hmm. um, yeah. if you're looking at the deal and you're looking at all the ways that it can fail, and you're um, protecting yourself against that and looking at all the options that you can have. What if the market does crash? Well, can I rent it? And if I rent it, do, am I going to make any money? Am I going to lose money? Can I afford to lose money? You know, all those kinds of things. And then you can go into the deal a little bit more with a sound mind versus, you mm -hmm. know, freaking out about, um, you know, all the things that could go wrong. But, you know, we've had deals where we didn't make money or we lost money, but they're, the losses are small compared to the gains. It's just like what I was talking about with trading stocks. It's like when, you know, you let your winners fly and, and you put a stop loss and you, you make sure that anybody, any loser stock that you end up buying, you get rid of quickly and you make a, a small loss. So your gains are higher than your losses. And, right. and that's really about consistently doing it as well. Um, but I, I think, you know, and a lack, a lack of knowledge, I think that people, you know, that makes them fearful because they just don't know. They're, they're just uncertain mm -hmm. about how to get started and what to do and, um, you know, like I said, all the things that can go wrong. Cause I, I mean, it, a lot of things can go wrong, especially sure. it, it's real estate. I mean, you know, it's bound to go, things are bound. Yeah, to we go. all know that as realtors, right? Yeah, <laughs> things exactly. can go wrong. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I mean it's like, it's a, just a constant thing. Um, but that's the other thing though. We know what can go wrong. We, it's not like, you know, regular buyers and sellers that don't have that experience. We know all the things that can go wrong. So yeah. I mean, we have the knowledge to be able to protect ourselves in that kind of situation. So in a market like this, where I, deals are much tougher to come by, everybody wants to be an investor right now. Um, you know, the, the, we, we no longer even go to the share of sales because people are paying retail there. So, you know, wh where, are, where are you specifically finding deals? What can you tell to that, 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 that agent or investor out there who's watching that is like, I just can't find any deals. Like, what, what are you telling people to do? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I believe in the whole land, sea, and air approach. I and mean, that's what we do in real estate, right? I mean, we mm-hmm. generate leads and we market to them, you know, a myriad of different ways. And, and, and it's the same thing with investing. So, um, you know, our approach is that we are looking for sellers who have a, a significant reason for moving, whether that's a pre foreclosure or tax lien or a bankruptcy or, you know, a, a death or something along those lines. And we market to them. So um, we do cold calls through thousand calls a day. We do um, mailers. We send them emails. Um, and you know, and and it's funny how we don't get the same responses from each approach. We get different people from yeah. our mailers, and we get from our calls, and different people from our. It's nuts. So, um, but you know, you have to have the right data. I mean, at the end of the day, the quality of the data that you have and your target yeah. of what you're looking for, you need to understand what that is, and then you market to them. And you build your list and you continue to market to them because it's still, even though people might be in distress, it's still a relationship. We've beat out other investors, not because we were the highest price, but because we had a good relationship with the client. Either we promised we wouldn't tear it down or we, uh, you know, we just gave them whatever they wanted and, and they knew that we were doing right by them. So, mm-hmm. um, and they knew we were going to follow through. There's a lot of investors out there that will put contracts on properties and never follow through or, they, they're wholesalers and they want to sign a deal and people have been burned by those, those people. And so they're, they're still going to be leery. So you have to be a person of your word. You have to have a good relationship and you do have to be able to per, uh, perform. Um, you know, you don't go into these contracts willy nilly. Like when we write a contract on a property, it's solid. It's, we are buying it. There's no way out. Um, we've done all of our due diligence and, and the sellers feel very confident in, in how we approach that. And we kind of, explain you know the downfalls of going with other people depending on the offer mm-hmm. what data are you guys using right now um so we actually are using uh well so i find the um the records from prop stream because we get ten thousand mm-hmm. records a month for 99 bucks and then okay. we um we append we don't append it through them because it's 30 cents a record and we talked about that right wow um, yeah, that's <laughs> isn't that insane <laughs> I'm like, okay, and it like crashes the website every time you try to do it. So it just just doesn't work. But to me, that, that means they don't want to do it. At 30 cents, that means we don't want to do it. If you're willing to pay that, we'll do it, but we don't want to do it. <laughs> That's actually true. Um, so then we append the data. We go for a guy named Jared. Um, and he's anywhere from three cents to 10 cents a record, depending on if you want email addresses. Um, we do get email addresses. We've realized that's actually a great source. We didn't realize that before. We weren't doing the emails before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll get email addresses. That's like five cents a record. Cell phone numbers is like three cents a record. It, it, you know, it comes out anywhere from like five to 12 cents a record. So, um, okay. you know, and you can find people on Upwork that will do skip tracing as well. So, um, but I, I found that prop streams data has been really solid. I mean, we, we crushed it over Memorial Day weekend. We got 31 leads over the weekend. I mean, yeah. Okay. Isn't that insane? So are you surprised like fun, like yeah. two two worlds that are so similar like real estate investing and I mean selling residential real estate essentially there I there's this huge focus like in residential real estate on buyer leads right and like you mm-hmm. know that's like that was like the whole sexy thing like the the internet buyer leads and and like the funny thing is like I feel like the real estate investors are actually better at generating seller leads which is you know, I mean, to me, yeah, it's it's it's, sure. it's insane because like the residential real estate world is like the more sexy world, right? Like that's where they sell you all like the, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the the yeah, yeah, exactly. And but the, this investor world, world is kind of like a secret <laughs> secret underground world, and yeah. like, but there's so much. I feel like they're just so much better at generating seller leads. Why do you think like two worlds that are so similar are actually so different? Well, I think it's because of what we're sold to as real estate agents, to be honest. I mean, if you you scroll down your Facebook feed, I mean, how many people are selling you coaching and leads and the next you know big thing and the thing that's going to solve all your problems and that kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, you're heavily, heavily marketed to as real estate agents. So I think that um, a lot of people can't cut through all the noise. You know, they're just constantly chasing shiny objects. They're trying to you know do quick fixes. Um, and, and this is not a quick fix. I mean, you know, investing in real estate or even, you know, sellers in general, I mean, the average seller lead is 18 months from the time that you generate it to the time that you, 
um, that you actually close it and they're more expensive. So, um, you know, I think that it's, it's a budgetary thing. I think it's how we're being sold as real estate agents. And I also think, like I said, that people are just afraid of how they're going to deal with those deals when they do come in and, and, I see it as we're problem solvers. I mean, that's what we do. Like yeah. if we can buy your house and it makes sense for us and it makes sense for you and we can help you solve your problem, that's great. If that doesn't make sense for you, then guess what? We have another option. We can help you sell your house too and and show you how you could be an investor on your own house and fix it up and get top dollar. Um, so, you know, I, I think that people just kind of need to look at themselves a little bit differently as far as what what are we actually contributing to the world and what are we helping people with? And, and the fact that we have all this knowledge and we do know all of this and not sharing it with sellers and not helping sellers in, 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 um, in sticky situations is, is not serving them. So, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like if I think people just kind of need to look at things a little bit differently. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, seller lead gen is absolutely way more expensive than buyer lead gen. So, you know, I think that's also a big part of it. Yeah, no, I agree. So like, what do you, what, if, from an investment standpoint, what, what do you prefer to do? Do you prefer, do you, do you prefer to wholesale? Do you prefer, prefer to flip? Do you prefer to buy and hold? What, what is your strategy typically? Or so what, 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 it, consider any. Closure, I have never wholesaled a house. So okay. um, I would love to do that. <laughs> I just have not, I have never done it. Um, so I have only flipped houses and, and held properties uh, for rent. Um, okay. And uh, I stopped flipping from the standpoint of like fixing it up and then reselling it um, about four years ago, once I realized how much the tax consequences were affecting what I was doing, um, you know, from mm -hmm. a wealth building strategy, as well as like, I mean, literally the year that I did the best, I, I, I had no money left because I gave half of it to my, the government and half to my ex and then it was all gone. So yeah. it was like, what am I doing? Like, this is insane. I'm taking all this risk and doing all this work and, and for what, you know, I wasn't, it, it wasn't actually building anything. And then once I, you know, I stopped doing that type of strategy and started doing the hold with the, with the exchanges, like you're doing the 1031 exchanges, the tax deferred exchanges. I mean, it was amazing how much faster with less effort and less risk it was building on itself. So, um, so that's been more of my strategy is, is if I am going to fix something up, I'll rent it out so that I can either, you know, exchange it later or do, you know, pay less capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's all about the options, right? So, but right. really what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, take one small deal and keep rolling it up into bigger and bigger and bigger deals. Um, and that's been, that's, that's amazing. awesome. Christy, that like, that, I love that. Do you ha like, can you talk, is there one, we can't share a screen here, but is there any way you can kind of talk through that? What you talked about before, how you did that? Yeah. So I'll go through some numbers um, that I have in front of me, which this is a real life example. So this is one of the first properties um, that I held when, um, after we were flipping for a while and, and, you know, I decided to, um, to start doing a different strategy. So this particular property, um, it was $22,000 out of pocket. So we bought it for 150,000 with a rehab loan. Um, so, and the rehab budget was 75,000. So that's 225,000 total for the acquisition and the rehab budget. Um, so with the $22,000 down payment, because it was a primary, um, we were able to fix it up without any money coming out of our pocket and um, and hold on to it. And then I ended up renting it after that. So the total acquisition was two hundred twenty five thousand, and then I sold it a year later for three hundred eighty nine thousand. So after like commissions and uh, holding costs and all that stuff, it was one hundred fifty five thousand dollars net. So the great thing is that I didn't you know take one hundred fifty five thousand dollars. I created it. Right. I mean, I created one hundred and fifty five thousand that I could then roll into the next property, which was more expensive. And then that one um, was a seven hundred thousand dollar property that we used that one hundred and fifty thousand for the down payment. Um, it didn't need any rehab. We bought it off market. It was a it was a probate deal. It was a, somebody inherited the property it was in relatively good shape. It was just really dated. Um, and, but it was really worth the land value because it was in a high priced land area. I know it's crazy to think that like land sells for like $800,000 around here, but it does. Um, so it was like 
$890,000 property. Um, and then we rented it out, made some money during rental, but it was nothing great because we're not in a great rental, you know, rental yeah. ratio market. So then the net proceeds after that was $163,000. So total in two years with only $22,000 out of pocket, we were able to do a tax-free exchange for $318,000. And then that's going into an apartment building. Um, and then that's going to literally, you know, pay for everything. I mean, I could retire yeah. if I wanted to. And that was off of one deal. Think about if you did only two of those a year. I mean, do you think you could find two yeah. deals or one deal a year, just even one out of all the sellers that we meet and all the people, all the networking and things that we do. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I find is just random because, you know, I see an agent post an off market property in a, one of our Facebook groups or something like that. So, um, you know, it's just amazing how different it is because if I had paid taxes on that, I'd have half the money. Yeah. I wouldn't be buying an apartment building. It it's crazy. Be, it's absolutely ridiculous. It would, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And it keeps your grubby little hands off the money, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like if I have money in the bag, it's gone. You know, I'll yeah. spend it. But if it's in a property and it's working for me and, and you know, I, I'm not, and besides you have to pay taxes on it if you keep doing the exchanges. So um, it just allows you to kind of build a nest egg a lot faster than if you're using your own money and you're not creating any type of wealth or, or additional opportunity. Yeah. So are there any like, um, it, so are you, is this your strategy now just on kind of a grander scale is just to like always be seasoning properties and then turning it over and then rolling it and rolling it and rolling it into potentially an apartment building, right? Which you never have to sell by the way. So you would never, you'd never have to pay taxes on that income, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and then so, the great thing is it's a 20 year loan and it gets paid off in 20 years and I'll be hanging out, you know, with you in Florida drinking drinks with umbrellas in them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and not, not to mention though, you, you can also refinance that, right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you don't have to pay, you, you can refinance that and take money out of it. You don't have to pay taxes on that money. Yep. Uh, you, and you could potentially roll that into other projects, but that's, I mean, I, I love that strategy. So for you right now, you have your residential real estate business, you have your investment business. Are you, so most of the stuff that you're looking for at this point is stuff that you can just buy and then season, buy and then season. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I did a flip this year, um, that we did pretty well on, but it was more like a passion project. Like I do have a little bit of a problem. Like I love, transforming houses and make them lit, you know, just feeling the soul of the house. Yeah. ridiculous. But I do love that transformation part of it. So I will take a project if I really want to renovate it and it doesn't make, cause that probably made no sense to hold on to at all. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it, and then roll it into something else or use that for, to pay for more marketing to find other deals. Um, so we're targeting some uh, outside areas where we're at to find hold properties. Um, and then we're also looking for bigger deals around here that we can do a 1031 exchange into a bigger property. But, you know, with where the market is right now, um, you know, we're trying not to do anything like real speculative, like, you know, development deals. I bought a yeah. property that I was going to develop and, and I'm just, I'm actually selling it to, you know, buy more holds because I really think that that, yeah. If you're going to do something right now, you really got to hedge your bet. You really have to protect your downside, right? You have hey, to. I want, yeah, like this is actually a great segue to where I was going because I, I really want you to elaborate on that. Um, another thing that you showed us during your session um, what was a slide about you know um, uh, KPIs like 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 marketing indicate or market indicators um, and where we're at actually today. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, and then what you, what you're doing in your business to kind of, you know, to protect yourself. And I, this isn't like, this isn't like a, a, the sky is falling because it, we don't feel that way at all. I don't think you feel that way, but I think you're being a little bit more cautious, but so tell us why that is. Well, I mean, you know, if you look at any of the economic indicators that are out there right now, whether it's the inverted yield curve or the amount of debt that we're everybody's sitting on with auto loan debt and corporate debt. Um, and I was actually just going to do a shout out to Dirk Zeller because I was just commenting on his um, Facebook post about how, you know, a lot of the loan guidelines have been loosening and, um, you know, corporate debt is at its all time highs at 69.3% of GDP. I mean, that's insane. You know, yeah. it's not going to end well. I don't believe in the sky is falling even when it was. I mean, I was watching Lehman Brothers collapse on TV while I was moving here to D.C. I mean, you know, it doesn't get much more fearful than that. But, yeah. um, 
But at the same time, with great chaos, uh, it's great opportunity, right? Great opportunity. Yeah. Um, but I'm not wanting to be stuck in any kind of chaos, meaning like I'm not going to, I don't want to be in the middle of selling a high priced property at a time when the market is soft. It may not be, you know, detrimental like it was before, but it could be, I mean, you know, around here, 20% is, is a couple hundred thousand. So um, if it drops that much, so really yeah. what I'm looking for is just things that are longer term. Um, I'm also at the point in my life where, uh, you know, I'm looking to have cash flow where, you know, um, my bills are covered whether I'm working or not. So I can pursue other things. So, it, you know, it's, I think if you're going to hedge your bet, the buy and hold, if you can get the right deal, um, mm -hmm. because you can wait it out. You don't have to worry about, especially if it's multiple, multiple units, because if one tenant can't pay or one moves out, you're not, you know, you're not have vacant, you don't have a vacant house. So if you have multiple yeah. units, um, that also decreases your risk because you have uh, more doors and, and, and less uh, issues of people not paying and having to kick them out and doing the eviction process right. and, on one tenant in one house. And now you have a, a huge mortgage you have to pay. So um, we're really looking at more multiple units, which is amazing how many, like there's really not a lot of great deals out there in multiple units either. So no, my, there's <laughs> not, insane, right? there really isn't. We're looking to, by the way. I, and yeah. so like I told you, like we're here at a duplex, we're actually looking to buy in Fort Myers beach. And um, there's just, there's just not a lot out there right now, unfortunately. Yeah. But if you so, find them and, and it's not your primary, I mean, the great thing is we're in real estate where you buy and sell houses. We help people buy and sell houses. But if it's something you're doing on the side, like I said, if you're only looking for one deal a year, I mean, you can easily handle that. And, um, you know, it's just incrementally increasing your wealth versus, you know, trying to make a bunch of money all hit the mother load, investing. win the lottery. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think a lot of times people get into real estate investing because they think it's like get rich quick. I'm going to, you know, do all this stuff and it's going to happen fast. And and while it can, it also cannot. Right. You can also drive yourself into the yeah. ground. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I just think just where we're at. I mean, we're definitely at a at a at a at a, at a peak. Um, I mean, the market's super hot, but we've also seen that change overnight before. So. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be stuck in a situation where I've got a, a super expensive property that I owe too much on and I can't get rid of. So, yeah. um, you know, the lower price points are easy to move regardless of what's going on in the market. And um, if I'm making cash flow, then it pays for itself. And I don't I'm not going to be as, you know, staying up all night worried about how I'm going to make a, you know, a huge mortgage payment because I have one tenant that left. Yeah. So talk me through like for you guys right now, like uh, if you're if you're looking at multifamily, what do you what do you look for? Like numbers wise, what what is the right deal? I mean, I would love a 10 cap, but <laughs> a property that's, yeah. that's uh, selling for 10 times the, the net income. Um, but, you know, we're we're still finding stuff that are that are like eight caps. So I know people that are selling like turnkey properties, meaning they will find the deal and rehab it for you and then yeah. manage it and you just buy it all done, ready to go at an eight cap. You, you basically don't do anything. Um, yeah. And you know, those, those guys exist as well. So, I mean, if you want something low risk, they don't have to do the work. You can find people out there that are doing, um, you know, really great, really great service for people. Meaning like they, they take on all of the rehabbing and everything and then they, give it to you on a platter with a tenant and an eight cap and they manage it for you and everything. So those do exist. Those are generally smaller multi-units um, mm -hmm. like single family homes or duplexes or, or triplexes. Um, and with apartment buildings, we found it's the same as any other deal. I mean, you said you found a commercial property off of a mailer, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how you can find landlords, you know, you're generally not going to find the LLC's phone number, you know, by skip tracing it or anything like that, but you can mail to them. They, you can't, you do have their yeah. address of the owner sometimes. Um, so, I mean, there's ways to find deals, but I definitely think that you have to find things off market. It's very, very tough to um, find something on the market. And I mean, people are paying stupid prices for investment deals right now. Oh, it's so. ridiculous. Yeah. That's another thing that kind of scares me too. Um, is the is the prices people are paying for stuff right now? Like we're actually running into appraisal issues in our market. Like we're we're really like stuff is not appraising, mm -hmm. and I so I think I think there is like 
I think appraisers are actually trying to just dial it back a little bit because, you know, they're seeing it too. And I, I know lenders are on the bus as well. Let me ask you this, like as an investment strategy, um, especially for like a, an, a, like a real estate agent uh, who has never bought an investment property before, and maybe they don't own their own home. How do you like, like house hacking? How do you like, because I know FHA will loan on property for like four, uh, four plexes. Um, they'll loan and that's three and a half percent down if it's personal residence, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. How you do know, you feel about that strategy? I think if you don't own a property, you got to start with your primary residence. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's wonderful. We don't have a ton of, um, multifamilies in our direct area in Virginia. There's more in DC, yeah. but the tenant laws are not great. Um, so, but if I could buy, if, if my first property, if, if I could go back in time, my first property would be like a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex. Um, yeah, because three and a half percent down, you can rent the other units. It basically pays for you to live there either for free or make some money. And then when you decide yeah. to move, you now turn it into an investment property. I mean, I think that's genius. And, yeah. um, yeah. I, I do think that people should start with their primary residence because like I said, even if you do a, a rehab, where you renovate it yourself in two years, you can sell it tax free and actually take that money. You don't have to do an exchange. Um, so right. I've even done with my primary residence, take, you know, whatever I don't need for a down payment on the next place and invest it elsewhere. Because I mean, where else are you going to get tax free money? <laughs> like where? Right. <laughs> Nowhere. And that, 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 stra that tax free strategy would actually work um, on that fourplex that you bought for three and a half percent down if yeah. you decided to um, turn it into a rental, right? And hold it for a year. And then you could potentially sell it and take whatever proceeds you made from that deal and turn it into, you know, ta a ta another tax free deal, right. right? That started out as a personal residence, turned into a rental, and then turned into maybe a potentially bigger rental, more profitable rental. So exactly. there's all these different ways of, of being able to get started. Um, I think that's just what makes real estate so fascinating to me yeah. is that there's just so many different ways to make money. Um, I just, I mean, I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a lot of us in real estate just love uh, chaos and variety. And I mean, this is the best business for it, right? I mean, it's like, oh No doubt. God. No deal's ever the same, right? No. Oh my gosh. And as soon as you think you know it all or you've learned it all or you've seen it all, you learn that you have not because yeah. you know, it's always something. Um, but I think that the main thing is people just need to get started. They just really have to, um, you know, figure out what their goals are, where they want to be in five years and then work backwards from there as far as what they can, um, you know, what they can accomplish with where they're at right now. And I, I think a lot of people are straddled with a lot of debt too. And, it doesn't uh, hurt to even wait and pay off a lot of your high interest debt before getting into something else. But at the end of the day, I think buying your own home, your your domicile um, is super important. And then, you know, kind of using that as an investment vehicle um, for other projects and kind of you, you can always start small and slow. You don't have to like I said, you don't have to light the world on fire and spend hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars on marketing. If you're only looking for, you know, one or two deals a year, you'll find them. If you're looking for, you know how it is, you seek, you shall find. Like if you're, if you're open to it and you're, you're wanting it and you desire it, you, it will come to you. It just will. Yeah. Talk about like, cause we just signed up with you guys at thousand calls and we're, we're getting right. We're getting our data together right now to, to send out, but talk about how you are, how are you utilizing ISAs, inside sales agents in, in, uh, in the investment world? So, um, so I think it's important to kind of separate the roles. So I read this book, it's called predictable revenue and it's, um, it was written by book. the guy. Yeah. It was written by the guy who started salesforce.com and anybody that doesn't know what salesforce.com is. It's a CRM. Uh, they do, you know, a billion or more a year in revenue. And what they found was when they um, separated out their sales roles, they actually became like 30 or 40 percent more productive. So what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have three different salespeople and in real estate, we're all of those people. When we first start and we're a single agent, we're all of those people, meaning you have your outbound mm -hmm. person that all they do is make outbound calls all day long. That's all they do. Then they find opportunities to send to the outside people, which would be your agents. And then there's their inside team, which really what their job is, is to follow up on inbound inquiries. So, you know, your sign calls, your website leads, 
uh, people that are inquiring about selling their house, postcards, that kind of stuff, um, to qualify the lead to either nurture it or um, you know set an appointment for your outside salespeople. So what we do um, is we use thousand calls a day for our outbound team. So we have um, yeah. outbound prospectors. That's all they do. We send them raw data. And then they just call, call, call all day long. Um, and then they send us uh, qualified leads. And then our inbound team mm -hmm. qualifies them and either sets the appointment for the outside person or um, nurtures them depending on you know where they're at in the process. Like I said, sometimes it's like 18 months before they actually sell their house. So yeah. Um, so they're constantly nurturing them, talking to them, sending them reports, you know, sending them information. We're sending them videos and, and that kind of stuff. So we're building our list with the outbound team. We're marketing to our list with the inbound and marketing team. And then the outside team is what closes all the deals. And yeah, it's a game changer. I mean, it's amazing how distracted you get when you're trying to do all three. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like an inspection or a deal is dying in the middle of you making phone calls or whatever, right? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you can, if you can't afford to separate them out, uh, it will, I mean, it, it's, it, it will drastically affect how your business operates and, and how, many, how many deals you yeah. make. So you're, you, you, you have outbound callers and inbound callers. Your outbounders are basically sifters, right? So they mm -hmm. get the mass data, right? They get right. the mass data. They load it into a dialing system and they dial, 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 right? I think, right. I think you guys are using like a five, nine dialer. It's a, it's a 10 line dialer, five, nine is. And, and so they might make, they literally might make 800 to a thousand calls every day, um, just yep. churning through data. And, they're not trying to set appointments. They will set appointments, but really what they're looking for is they're looking for somebody to raise their hand and say, I might be interested in selling my home, right? right. Whether, whether it's an investment deal or uh, whether it's, you know, sit down as a real estate agent and I can sell your house for you for, you know, whatever your commission is. Right. Um, but you have two different strategies, right? And, and, and I hope people connect with that. I don't think maybe I, I prefaced that enough, um, but by sitting down in, in these appointments is like having a real estate license gives you a distinct advantage um, over an investor because you can actually sell the property. If they don't want to, if they're not looking for a quick sale, if they're not in a, dist a distressed position, you still have the opportunity of, of, of doing a really good job and selling that property for them so that they can move on to whatever's next, right? Yeah. So we tell them we're a total solution. I mean, whatever you need, we can help it. You know, if you need to, to fix up your house, we can help you with that. If you need to sell your house for retail, we can help you with that. If you need to buy somebody to buy it right now, which we've had people that are like, I need you to buy this tomorrow. Right. So um, then we can do that too. And that's really what it is. It's just, I mean, it's just helping people with wherever they're at um, and what they need. And so we're a total solution because only 90, uh, I'm sorry, not 90, only five to 10% of the people are really going to need to sell their house for cash off market. Yeah. And it even makes sense for them to do it because a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. Like I, it's amazing to me, these people with these perfect houses thinking that we're going to buy it for cash, like for full price. Yeah. Like, why would we do that? Um, so, you know, but we have all those options for them so they can decide what they want to do if they want to, um, you know, like I said, if they need to sell, that's a very different thing. Or some people just don't want to mess with it. They inherited the property and they could fix it up or they could put it on the market, but they just don't want to mess with it. They just want something to buy it, take it off their hands and make it yeah. easy. Um, so it's really just about uncovering. And that's really what the inbound team does is they uncover the truth. What it is. Really go. Which way it's going to go. Am I going to send, a, am I going to send an agent or am I going to send an investor? Right. It, it's, exactly. it's one or the other. Yeah. You know what I like about what you just said? Like the, 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 it is funny because you do like, if you're talking about what, eight to 10% of a hundred people, um, uh, they, they actually, they would sell their property off market, uh, for cash or whatever. But then the rest of those people, right. They're going to want, they want mark, they want market, mm -hmm. uh, for their, their, for their property. They want market price. And so I found though, it's so funny because if you actually sit down and do the math right in front of people, uh, you know, and you tell them like it's full disclosure. You know, if if I buy your property, you know, it's because you know we're looking for some sort of a value add component so that we can improve the property and potentially make money on it or, or hold it ourselves and be able to put somebody in here to rent it out and and you know hopefully make some sort of a margin on it that way. But I I found it like if you if you actually if you sit down and work the math out as a flip and just work it backwards, and and you do it with their price. And it just shows you, you know, you might like have a thirty or forty thousand dollar loss, and you're you, you sit there in front of them and say, "Now, 
you understand now that this is why I wouldn't buy the property, right? Because I'd be out of business after I did your deal, right? I actually I'm not in, I'm, never done that. I like that to show them the actual loss. I mean, that's a really good. Oh, <laughs> listen, it is, it is, yeah. it works so good it, it, because yeah. they sit there and they go, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense that you would buy it. And, um, but, but what's really cool is that then you get connected with them on what you really need to be doing. And that's signing a listing agreement and getting the property on the market and showing it to, you know, all the buyers that are out there that are willing to pay you the market price for your property. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to work it, uh, you know, appropriately. I mean, it's always best to just be upfront with people and, um, you know, I mean, like I said, I just tell people right away, like, w these are your options. We're going to give you all your options and you can decide. I mean, either way, I don't really care what you do as long as I think, you know, it works for you and it's, it's what's best for you. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I'm sorry. I'm just like totally stuck on what you just said. Like, why, why have I never done that before? Like showing them the actual numbers? Cause I show them the numbers of the, of the flip, like, hey, this is why we, you know, we put all this money into it, and this is everything that goes. We didn't off. do that at for Christy. Like, we literally just started doing that like six months ago. We weren't doing it either, we, and we were like, we were, we were blown away that these people thought we would pay retail for their property and, until we did that, and it was like, poof! It's like yeah. this light went off, and like they saw it too, and it was like, oh, this is great. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, so, I yeah, I, I, I would highly recommend that. I like that. I mean, because it's a demonstration. It's it's getting them involved and also showing them, you know, why it doesn't make sense. Because I think on the other side, people are like, you know, you're trying to steal houses or this is crazy or whatever. But it's like, you know, they, yeah. it's just because they don't understand. And um, but uh, again, you know, the people that you actually buy their house, it's usually for a very I mean, it's usually a reason and it's usually not yeah. in good shape and they're not going to fix it up anyway. Um, but the retail guys, you know, I get that. And I always tell them too, look, we can put the cash offer on your property. And then if it doesn't sell, we can still buy it for cash. Um, and then that yeah. way you have an insurance policy and you can guarantee that it's going to sell versus right. you know, maybe hopefully getting wrapped up in a six month to a year contract with an agent who doesn't do what they say they're going to do or promises to the world. And then it doesn't happen. And now you're stuck in a jam. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just, again, having more solutions for them based on whatever their situation is. Right. Which is essentially the whole Craig Proctor guaranteed sale thing, right? Is you've got mm -hmm. an off, there's always an offer on the table. And, and so you're right. It, 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 it's, it's, it's an exit strategy. Well, listen, Christy, it has been, um, it has been as, as, as good as I thought it would be um, <laughs> and, and perhaps even better. Um, okay. And I, I honestly, it, I cannot believe 47 minutes has gone by and, because I could still probably talk to I you know. for another hour forever yeah <laughs> and i'm i'm sure people will have questions after this because there's really just so much more information to unpack so i like for you if if somebody watches this and they really want to connect to that investment world uh and, and they want to get in touch with you how would you recommend that they do that um they can just facebook message me um i mean it's christy moore on facebook it's the christy moore on instagram they can direct message me on either one um i don't I'm not on it all the time, so it'll probably be a day before I get back to you. Um, but okay. you know, I love this is stuff that I love. I love helping people with this, um, so I'm more than happy to um, help people out. And if they want to set set up a strategy call, I can send them my calendar link, and we can do a, like a 45 minute session of like really hammering it out as far as how you know they can start an investment arm or look for investment properties or even up their investment game if they're already successful. We can help them out with that too. Um, yeah. it's definitely something that I'm passionate about and I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody that has questions. I think it, well, you know, I, I just would like to help people get started too. I mean, if they're really worried about how to, to start their first deal or whatever, I mean, that's, that's very exciting to me. Yeah. Awesome, man. Listen, it has been so much fun. And, and I, are you going to be in Orlando here in, a, in, uh, in a week? I will. Are you not. going to the shareholders meeting? I be there? No, but I, I'm actually going to be at an investment conference at REWW. Um, I'll give them a little shout out uh, in San Diego next week. So um, is that Kent excited. Clothier? Yeah. Yeah. Kent Clothier. Um, so okay. I, and his events are always amazing. So, um, you know, I'm just really excited to go and, and continue to learn and hone our skills with all of this. Yeah. Well, Christy, thank you so much again. And, um, you know, that that that's probably going to be worth another listen or two. <laughs> and I, I really, I truly love sharing these stories week after week because I know they're literally changing agents' financial lives, my own included. 
Um, as always, if you know someone that might enjoy the podcast, please share it with them. And if you like the podcast, please go to wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. If you want to learn more about my business uh, or connecting with me and how we sell over 300 properties a year, you can go to meetmikewall.com and schedule a strategy session with me. And that's it for this one, folks. Christy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day. You too.